fantastic. Um, well, we might get started. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jenny Pearson. I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. And before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on tonight and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you from Anawan land, from the beautiful Northern Tablelands in Armidale. And it's been a very cold week. I don't think it's been much over 10 degrees all week. <laughs> Got to love winter in the New England. Um, welcome to our webinar tonight. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in our education library on our website uh, over the next couple of days. Um, there will be an evaluation that will pop up at the end and we would love your feedback. So if you could please fill it in. Um, and please don't hesitate to put any questions in the chat box and we'll endeavour to um, answer them all during the evening. Um, our webinar tonight is Exercise for Management of Breast Cancer Related Lymphedema. Our presenter is Julia Britton. She's a senior physiotherapist and lymphedema specialist from the Caden Centre. Okay, Julia, I'll hand over to you. Uh, all right, can you hear me okay, Jenny? I hope so. <laughs> yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank um, Jenny for um, being my IT support for, <laughs> for this session. Um, and uh, I didn't actually chat to you there, Jen, but um, I guess I'll just let you know when, um, when I need the slides moved forward. Um, hopefully that works pretty seamlessly for us. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Um, okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank um, thank everyone for coming along tonight um, and thank the PHN um, for the opportunity to come and talk tonight as well. Um, as Jenny mentioned, I'm a senior physio working out of a place called the Caden Centre um, and we're in Warrabrook in Newcastle. So I'm going to take the opportunity to give you a little bit of an idea about what the centre is and, and what we do, um, and then hopefully give you a little bit of information um, that's helpful for anyone um, who is in the field of, of seeing people who, who've had, um, you know, any kind of breast cancer treatment that might have impacted their lymphatic system. So if you wouldn't mind flicking ahead, Jen, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I too would like to just um, acknowledge that um, I'm speaking tonight from the lands of the Awabakal people. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to um, both the Awabakal and Waramai people who um, are the traditional custodians of the, the land that we work on um, and also um, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and any First Nations people that are here listening tonight. Um, thank you, Jen. <laughs> Um, so um, here's a little photo of our um, setup that we have at the Caden Centre. Um, alongside it here, I've just sort of tried to put together a little bit around what I'm going to speak to tonight. So I'm going to start by talking through what lymphedema is, um, who we know is more at risk of developing it, and therefore I guess who should be referred on for, um, you know, treatment or assessment earlier rather than later. Um, looking at what other sort of things that um, kind of make the lymphatic system work a lot harder and what are the things that make it function a little bit better because essentially those are the things that we use to treat um, any kind of problems with swelling in general usually. Um, and I guess the really exciting bit for me is the um, research base, looking into the research base for how exercise is a really great treatment for lymphedema. Um, so hopefully that's interesting to everyone. Just before I get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit through um, the Caden Centre. So if you can flick on the slide for me, Jen, that'd be great. <laughs> um, so keep that little image in your mind. The Caden Centre is um, a purpose-built facility um, in Warrabrook, um, which is in Newcastle. Um, 
probably just a five minute drive from um, the Mata Hospital in Newcastle. Um, and incidentally, that's where I done the bulk of my clinical work has been at the Mata Hospital working in acute care oncology and lymphedema there since 2005. Um, and probably in the oncology sphere, um, you know, specialising in that since 2007. Um, so back to the Caden Centre. <laughs> um, we have physios and we have exercise physiologists on staff. Um, we're a not-for-profit registered charity. And so, um, yeah, I guess we're, um, yeah, we're looking to, we're, we're in a space where um, essentially uh, we're founded by a lady by the name of Sue Clark Petrollo, uh, who was a three-time cancer patient herself. Um, she was a person who really loved being active, still does, um, and she was, um, you know, shocked, I guess, to find during her treatment and then also her recovery um, that there really wasn't much uh, around for cancer patients to access where, you know, in terms of something that made them feel really safe and really comfortable um, and was staffed by people who, I guess, had a little bit more expertise in what they were doing. Um, so um, she decided to try and rectify that and her solution to that problem was to try and set up um, the Cadence Centre. Um, and so our aim at the Caden Centre is to translate the latest research um, in exercise into practice. So um, we see people for, um, you know, we, we offer kind of physiotherapy and exercise physiology services. Um, but in general, we're trying to see people who have either a um, diagnosis of cancer or have been diagnosed with a chronic condition. Um, we also see their family if they want to come and help support them as well. <laughs> and so um, that's, I guess, we're trying to be a fairly holistic kind of place to, to really support people when they need that, that little bit of support. Um, we are um, the current recipients of a business sustainability grant through the PHN. So. Um, there was a little bit of time there. Um, the Caden Center was set up back in about, um, I think it started functioning in 2018. Um, yeah, sort of, you know, doing doing business, but the um, obviously some very tough years through COVID meant that it had to shut down. And um, there was quite a, you know, an amazing sort of groundswell of support with a um, huge amount of people um, in the local community coming on board to support us, to, to help us try and access, um, a you know something to keep us open and and this is how we were successful at becoming the recipients of a grant um, to basically help um, the Caden Centre to establish itself as a really sustainable business um, and we've got some funding through the PHN until 2025 to help us do that so um, next slide please Jenny <laughs> um, so the mission that we have as I've sort of already mentioned is to translate that. Um, you know, the best sort of research that we have at the moment um, into, you know, what exercise is effective and useful for people um, into practice. Um, the Caden Centre itself is set up to be basically a place where it functions like a gym. But, um, you know, I think one of the best ways I've heard the place described is that, um, you know, essentially people, people go to most gyms to look better, <laughs> but people go to the Caden Centre to feel better. Uh, and that's what we try and do. Um, we've got all the usual kind of equipment you'd expect to see in a gym set up. Um, but essentially, we're seeing people who maybe wouldn't feel comfortable in a usual sort of gym space. So people who are really, you know, have really kind of obvious signs that they might be going through cancer treatments, um, you know, things like NG tubes or, um, you know, the, um, you know, hair loss and, and things like that. Um, I guess that's, that's what pretty well all of our patients look like. Um, and so it's a space where, you know, instead of feeling like they're kind of the odd one out, it's definitely a space where people feel um, hopefully supported and comfortable to attend and, and really to, to work on the things that we know the research is telling us are so useful, so helpful for them to do, um, even throughout that really difficult time through treatment. Um, I guess the other thing that we have a really big focus on at the moment as well is trying to educate the people that are attending um, because we know um, the space that we've set up is something that we hope is really supportive and helpful for people while they need it. 
Um, but we also want to give them the skills to be able to take what they've learned and go and use it back into their everyday life. Um, even if that means they don't come back to our, our centre, um, you know, if they take, take what we've taught them and they can, you know, go and attend their local gym, that's a real win for us as well. Um, and so um, next slide, please, Jenny. <laughs> Um, yeah, the goal that we have at the at the Caden Centre is basically to to support people who who need this extra supervision, extra support, um, extra monitoring um, for their conditions, um, to work with them and to work with their um, their doctors, their GPs, as well as any specialists involved in their care. So, you know, for instance, just this week I've been in touch with um, you know oncology surgeons, I've been in touch with orthopedic surgeons. Um, you know, we've we've got regular contact with lots of the clinical care coordinator nurses um, for all different kinds of cancer streams, um, and you know, and and more, I guess. <laughs> um, but that's just a few. I know, yeah. I guess the other one would be, and another one that comes to mind is like the pel pelvic floor specialist physios and things like that as well. Um, so I think we provide a service where. Um, I, I know we provide a service where we're monitoring people. Um, you know, a lot more than they might be monitored in a normal sort of standard gym setup. So I guess people who are undergoing those sorts of treatments and having, you know, fairly large fluctuations in their condition, um, yeah, we hope to provide a service that's really, um, you know, supportive uh, and, and able to sort of recognise um, you know, when things are appropriate to, you know, when it's appropriate to regress people and do more with them and, and also when it's more appropriate to, to sort of scale back and to, and to um, you know, recognise any signs that we, we might need to do things differently as well or, you know, alert their, their doctors to, to anything that we think might be, um, you know, impacting their treatments and things like that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I've popped a little flyer there in the corner around the lymphedema, um, you know, work that we do. Um, but just so you've got a little bit of an idea, I guess we run a whole range of services at the Caden Centre. There's um, what we call exercise oncology. Um, that's delivered by either an exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist, um, all of who are, you know, are experienced in seeing cancer patients. Um, the, we offer physiotherapy in the form of, you know, musculoskeletal assessments and treatments. So I guess that's been useful if people have, you know, niggling injuries or if they're trying to start new exercise programs that they haven't done before and those kinds of things, we're able to sort of um, assist them in-house if, if anything like that's needed. Um, we've got a um, specialised clinical Pilates exercise physiologist on staff at the moment and she delivers, um, you know, really great individual assessments as well as group classes. So there's a lot of people, um, you know, and actually we've been using that as, as a really great way to help people, uh, I guess, take the opportunity that they have at their um, kind of, you know, that, that they've been given in terms of trying to, um, rebuild for some of the treatments that their body has been through um, and and looking at kind of um, using that that moment of of uh, you know vulnerability I guess or or um, you know something that's maybe yeah really difficult situation and turning it hopefully into something that can be really good and really useful for people to be able to um, to build from a really stable foundation. So the focus we have is on sort of rebuilding core strength, working on, you know, muscles that are going to stabilise and support movement. And that's that's basically the ethos of Pilates. And so that fits really beautifully into what we do at the Caden Centre. Um, we're doing some really exciting work at the moment in HIIT training, so that high intensity interval training. And um, we've got some pretty exciting um work happening in the prehabilitation space as well. So this is something that has been shown by research to be super useful for um, anybody preparing for surgery, but in particular patients that we know have either been through, you know, cancer treatments before they have their surgery um, or um, people who are going to be going through those sorts of treatments after they have their surgery as well. Um, We've um, been lucky enough to work with some excellent physiotherapists um, from up at the John Hunter. 
um, delivering some programs for them since 2018 um, in um, this high intensity interval training um, in preparation for surgery. Uh, and yeah, the um, changes that we can see in people being able to improve, um, you know, their um, physical fitness, um, you know, looking at using some of the cardiopulmonary exercise testing to really see, um, measure that, that change that people are able to achieve um, has, has been really, really interesting. I guess a lot of the work I've done in the hospital was with people who are, you know, very acutely unwell, needing obviously hospital care. And, and this has been really um, another exciting sort of thing to see that, you know, there's lots of people who are able to engage with this, you know, incredibly difficult, <laughs> um, you know, task of, of really preparing their, their body and, and their mind to undergo surgery. And so that's, that's uh, I guess, a really exciting part of working um, at the Caden Centre. Um, we offer home exercise programs for people as well. We know that it's a really difficult time for people to engage in any kind of new exercise program. And, you know, there's lots of times where, um, you know, things like being immunosuppressed um, can keep you out of being able to participate in any kind of group sort of setting. And so we really try and accommodate, um, you know, whatever's going to suit people best, I guess, um, knowing that probably the best results do come from being in centre and having a little bit more support and, and I guess motivation to, to do a little more. Um, the last bit that I've got here is the lymphedema services that, that we offer. Um, got a really big focus on educating people, um, screening people and trying to get people, get the message out about um, picking up changes in um, anything that might indicate lymphedema early. Um, I've got this acronym MLD, which is the manual lymphatic drainage massage that um, is really helpful for um, lymphedema patients and really helpful for them to know, I guess, how to do it themselves as well, because that's that's really much more effective than having to wait and, um, you know, book into a therapist if they can too. Um, look at um, bandaging and compression garment prescription as well. And look, I didn't mention exercise there, but that's a really big part of what we do. <laughs> um, so next slide, please, Jenny. Um, so I do take the opportunity and, you know, bear with me, this is almost over on the Spruiking the Caden Centre <laughs> um, little, little snippet here. Um, but um, this is, yeah, a little infographic that was created by the American College of Sports Medicine um, on, um, you know, exercise and cancer and basically what the research is for which, which exercise forms are really useful. And the exciting, about, the exciting thing about this particular um, infographic or why it made it onto my presentation tonight is that it does actually mention that exercise is a really great intervention for lymphedema. So that's really exciting to see. So um, I guess that's something that um, has been left off a lot of the, um, you know, the information that's out there for people around um, what they should do to manage their lymphedema. And it's really nice to see that, you know, at least... Um, you know, I, I guess these things move slowly as well. It, it's not, you know, straightforward to just add in lots of stuff to these these types of documents, but it, it just proves that this is something that's becoming more, um, you know, more known and 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 uh, people are, are trying to encourage it even more. So that's great. Next slide, please, Jenny. <laughs> Last infographic. <laughs> Um, but this is another one on um, the benefits of exercising with cancer. And so just if, um, you know, you needed something else to motivate people to, to try and um, undertake some exercise while they're, um, you know, on their journey um, through cancer. Um, yeah, just a few, few really exciting snippets there. So um, why not exercise and see if we can improve um, you know, decrease the severity of side effects from cancer treatments, um, you know, reduce complications from surgery and the time spent in hospital, um, help, help recovery, um, improve sleep, fatigue and relieve stress, anxiety and depression, um, help maintain a healthy weight. That's another really important, um, important thing. I guess another thing um, about why exercise is so good for cancer patients is, is that, um, you know, cancer patients are still 
at risk of a whole range of other conditions as well, right? Like the rest of us. So, you know, um, I guess while you're recovering from your cancer treatments is a really great time to also, you know, build some cardiovascular fitness to try and assist with things like managing high blood pressure, managing your risk of heart disease and stroke as well. Um, osteoporosis is a really um, interesting part of, uh, becomes part of lots of cancer patients' life, particularly when they're on, um, some of the hormone treatments for breast cancer and for prostate cancer. Um, we know that um, both of those, uh, or you know, particular types of hormone treatments, actually, um, you know, have have a long term effect of of putting patients at risk of developing osteoporosis by, um, you know, changing the way the hormones that that usually help build bone. Um, you know, uh, you know, the levels of those hormones in the body. And so um, it's really important for patients who are on long term hormone treatments to be doing some type of resistance exercise to offset their risk of developing problems with osteoporosis. Um, we know that, I guess, in terms of, you know, if you're a cancer patient, the more active you are, the less, um, you know, the, you know, research tells us that you reduce your risk of recurrence. Um, you know, of these particular cancers, uh, breast, prostate, um, bowel, endometrial. Um, and I guess the other thing that's really important part of the Caden Center as well is this idea that, um, you know, being active and being around other people kind of, you know, in a group sort of setting um, can be a way to meet lots of people. And, you know, I think we find at the Caden Center there's lots of people who, um, you know, might have a really wide, really, you know, great support network, a great amount of, um, you know, family and people supporting them all the way through their, their cancer, but um, they still feel, can still, still have lots of feelings of loneliness um, around the fact that, you know, they might not know that many people, particularly young people um, who are unlucky enough to have a cancer diagnosis. Um, so I think um, that's really one of the, the great, amazing things that I've been able to see um, in working at the Caden Centre is how much, um, people gain, um, you know, a sense of a sense of kind of belonging, either belonging there, um, and feeling like, um, you know, they're meeting a whole lot of people who are in a similar situation, maybe going through similar treatments, um, and that can be a really, really supportive thing at a time when you know maybe you don't know many people at all that are having to deal with the same kinds of things. Um, everyone's different, <laughs> but I, I would say that. Um, you know, people who maybe wouldn't necessarily engage with a usual kind of sit down and talk support group, um, you know, there can be lots of really great opportunities for people to chat and um, connect um, over, you know, the, you know, doing their bicep curls at the dumbbell station, um, which which is really, really lovely to see that, that um, you know, it's a, it's a supportive place that people feel um, that they can they can kind of have those conversations as well. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. <laughs> so here we go. This is what I came for. This is what you guys came for, hopefully, um, hearing a little bit about um, lymphedema. And I guess the place I usually start when I'm talking about lymphedema is to kind of do a very, very brief, very, very brief um, talk about the lymphatic system. Um, because this is, this is, I guess, why, why it all happens. Um, you know, the lymphatic system is one of the most under-researched systems in the body. Um, it's, uh, it's part of, it's, it's a really, it's got some really vital functions, but, um, it's, it's sort of just like this lesser cousin of, of the rest of the circulatory system is what it seems like. Um, there's not, not a huge amount, um, of research into it. Um, I guess the time where, you know, people are most familiar with their lymphatic system would be, um, you know, maybe we're all a bit more familiar with it these days um, since the pandemic. But, um, you know, where where you would have come into come come across the lymphatic system, you know, as a, you know, for um, in your own personal experiences, usually if you've ever had, um, you know, any kind of virus or um you know, where, you know, flu, things like that, where your um, lymph nodes swell up in your neck, you feel the glands all through your neck. Um, and I guess that's, that's where, that's what we're familiar with. That's the lymphatic system. And it's doing part of its job uh, in being part of the immune system. 
So, um, you know, the, there are cells within each lymph node that um, are able to be released to help fight off some of some of those, um, you know, virus virus cells. So, um, essentially, the lymphatic system has a lot of components that are really vital for its functioning. Um, we've got this sort of open network of lymph nodes, ducts, and vessels. Um, from the little picture that I've got there, you can see the lymph nodes are in these little sort of groups and clumps. We've got big groups of lymph nodes through the neck, through the both armpits and through the groin. Um, but we've got lots of little uh, lymph nodes in a few different places, like in your, behind your knees, in your popliteal fossa, in your cubital fossas as well. Um, and yeah, a few, a few sort of um, in, in all different places as well. So the primary function um, or the big, big ticket function um, in terms of what the lymphatic system um, does in, with lymphedema or ha how it sort of malfunctions with lymphedema is that um, your lymphatic system is responsible for draining all of the tissues in your body. Um, so um, I've got a little graphic a little bit further on, but essentially your heart pumps blood all the way through your body um, and we get down as we go through arteries the arteries get smaller and smaller and smaller and you finally get down to the very small vessel level the capillary bed and at that point that's where the um, arteries switch around and become veins taking deoxygenated blood back to the lungs for reoxygenation um, and it's at that capillary bed level that the lymphatic system does the most of its work <laughs> in terms of picking up this tiny amount of fluid that leaks out into your tissues all the time. So every time your arteries are pumping that little bit of blood all the way through, every time your heart's pumping that blood all the way through your arterial system, we find at this capillary bed level, there's this leakage of fluid into tissues. And it's the lymphatic system that's responsible for picking up that fluid and also the other um, components that sit within that fluid, which can be things like leftover bits of, you know, dead cells, debris, infection, um, bacteria, um, stuff that your body doesn't need, you know, waste products from other, other reactions that have happened. The lymphatic system picks up all of that. It takes it up through the lymphatic channels all the way back up to these groups of lymph nodes. And the lymph node itself is like this filtration system. Um, there are cells within the lymph node, as we said, that have an immune role and can sort of, um, you know, chomp up any bits of virus and, and things that, you know, it's a very simplified version, of course. But essentially, um, you know, the, the lymph node's job is that once it's drained, once it's filtered all that fluid, basically we put, it moves that filtered fluid into the larger kind of collecting ducts for the lymphatic system. Um, from there, we see that some of that, um, the bulk of that fluid that's been filtered is put back into the circulatory system. So the body doesn't like to waste stuff if it doesn't have to. Um, and all of those other byproducts, um, along with some of the fluid, are then excreted through your kidneys, um, your bladder, and eventually your urine. Does that all? <laughs> I'll take a breath. <laughs> but yeah, essentially what we see is that there are some tiny little... Um, valves within the lymphatic system so they probably function in a little bit of a similar way to what what you're used to the um the venous system functioning like as well um, as i said we've got these really big kind of nodal basins um in the um in the groin in the axilla um, and when we're talking about um i guess the big thing that the lymphatic system has a role in in um, terms of cancer is unfortunately it's you know i guess based on it being this sort of system that's cleaning up and you know getting all of these different different sort of bits and pieces of cells and moving things from one spot to another it's actually um one of the places that we know is really common for cancer to first metastasize to um and so these days there's um you know a lot of emphasis on trying to um not take more of more of the lymphatic system than is completely necessary so there's lots of techniques that are used um, to try and assess which lymph nodes we need to take which you know which ones are most likely to have been you know draining these particular areas um, you know wherever your cancer tumor site um, primary site was um, 
but yeah, I guess that that means that unfortunately the lymphatic system is a spot that is generally um, it's really common that we need to damage it to basically do the best checking that we can to make sure there's no cancer cells spreading through that lymphatic system as well. So I'll just get the next slide, please, Jenny. <laughs> Yay. So um, I've got here, um, if you're a, you know, a bit of a lymphatic nerd like me, you'd be really excited about these little, <laughs> this little picture that I've got here. It's one that's um, been drawn up by um, a professor in anatomy who's working at um, Macquarie University um, down in Sydney. Um, and he, yeah, there's a there's a really big lymphedema centre down there called, um, you know, they use the acronym ALERT. Um, but he's done um, a lot of study into um, the anatomy of the lymphatic system. And I was lucky enough to attend a course that was run there um, well, years ago. But um, essentially, he's mapped out what we call these territories. And so we can see that I guess um, what I wanted to show in this picture was just the idea that, you know, lymph nodes that are in the axilla are basically draining from, you know, this green area that we can see um, on the on just the one side of this kind of dotted line that goes up through the midline of this um, person. <laughs> um, and so that's just to give you a bit of an idea, I guess, you know, when we remove lymph nodes from the arm, we're not expecting to see lymphedema happen in the legs is, you know, is that really basic straightforward thing. The lymph, lymph, lymphatic system is divided into these territories and this is part of, you know, what helps us to figure out, um, you know, the treatments that are going to work for, for people based on, you know, where they're getting swelling and where those, um, where we see that drainage happening from the lymphatic system as well. Um, this was a little infographic I was talking about that gives us nice little a nice little just um, idea of where that lymphatic system sits in terms of you know its role within that circulatory system as well. Um, and the last little picture here is to remind me to talk to you about um, how I explain lymphedema to patients. And I think it's really useful. I try and use um, simple language um, anytime I'm talking about this. <laughs> so bear with me if you can. But the idea is that, um, you know, every lymph node within your body, I guess it has, we know it has a lot of different roles, but um, one of the biggest jobs that it does is something similar to a roundabout um, at a busy kind of intersection. So I've got this really nice picture here of this roundabout with, you know, the four different uh, roads kind of all coming into that one, one spot. Um, and what we see in the body is that this is kind of a representation of what the lymph node is doing. It's kind of receiving some of this, um, you know, fluid and extra bits and pieces. And then the big job that it does is kind of move it on to its next destination. And when we go into the body and we take out all of these little roundabouts that, um, you know, are, are sort of doing this job of, you know, receiving some of that fluid, but then moving it on to its next spot, um, essentially what we see is that, um, you know, that fluid, uh, you know, no, nobody sends a message out to the body to tell it to not, not, not send stuff up anymore. It, it keeps going. So we see that the peripheral tissues keep using these lymphatic vessels and keep trying to, you know, push this fluid up to where it's going to go to this lymph node. And unfortunately, um, we don't have the lymph node there anymore. Um, we might not just not have the lymph node. We might have a bunch of scar tissue <laughs> that's formed there as well. Um, from, you know, from the essential treatments that people have to have for their cancer surgeries. And so um, what we see is that basically what you can imagine happening at any spot where you took a roundabout out like this is that we get this kind of traffic congestion that, that comes. And the idea is that, you know, these cars, they just build up, they just bank up and um, slowly over time, that's, that's what we see happening in lymphedema, that that fluid that's not being moved on to its next spot is, is just sitting there. And um, yeah, that's got a few, you know, it's, it's, it's a situation that we don't want to have going on for too long. <laughs> we know that, you know, if you've just got fluid sitting stagnant, um, it's, you know, it's probably got a higher risk. You know, people who, who have had, you know, who have lymphedema have a higher risk of developing things like inf infections like cellulitis, little bits of infection and inflammation within the tissues. Um, and so, 
um, I guess what we, you know, that's another thing that's really important for how we treat lymphedema as well, because um, these territories that we're seeing here all marked out, um, we know that um, essentially fluid doesn't, doesn't usually move across those different territories. Um, what we see is, um, you know, a backlog of fluid that happens down into, into the peripheries based on where that blockage to um, lymph fluid movement starts. And over time, I guess what we'd see is that rather than that blockage sort of staying right at the right at the point where that, that lymph node's been removed, we see that, you know, gravity starts to pull it further down into the peripheries of the body. So, you know, even though people might sort of notice you know, their watch being tight, and that might be one of the first signs of lymphedema or the rings being tight. You know, actually that that fluid that's down in the hand is probably in the hand because there's fluid all the way along that's stopping the movement of that through there. Um, so I'll just get the next slide, please, um, Jenny. Now this I found, I hope, yeah, it's a little bit, I'll explain what it is. <laughs> um, but these are another couple of pictures from this really um, kind of elegant sort of study that, that was put together by this anatomist um, from uh, Macquarie University as well. Um, and, you know, a little bit, um, you know, not, not the nicest thing, but he's got an X-ray here or like a, a scan that's showing um, a, um, you know, this is a, a dog that they took lymph nodes out of, which is really sad. Um, but uh, he did it to kind of try and have a look at what happens after we take out those lymph nodes and what they were able to show in this poor little dog, sorry about that, um, the lymph nodes that they removed um, don't regrow. That doesn't happen. So what we've got this first picture up the top is looking at, um, yeah, these two, these little arrows are kind of pointing to the lymph nodes that they removed from the system. And what they did was, um, you know, kept this little guy alive and then had a look later at what had happened. And what we can see is that all of these lymphatic channels sort of um, developed, grew, regrew, these beautiful little channels regrew. And, you know, rather than um, taking lymph fluid to the lymph nodes, you know, here in what would have been like the right kind of axilla, right, you know, um, armpit for the dog, they actually started taking it across to the left side, which which is great. And I guess this is why lots of people don't develop lymphedema as well after having this type of surgery to their lymph nodes, because we see that um, there is this possibility, um, you know, and lots of people's lymphatic systems, you know, manage this adaptation where rather than relying on lymph nodes that aren't working, I guess the body does eventually put some things in place, put some, um, yeah, some <laughs> effort into regrowing and moving some of these channels and, and utilising other sorts of channels to move this fluid, um, which is pretty amazing, isn't it, um, to, to think that your body can adapt in such a way. And, you know, look, I'll, I'll go through just a little bit of, you know, the reasons why that doesn't happen for some people, I guess. Um, but, yeah, um, next slide, please, Jenny. So what is lymphedema? I think we've been through that. It's this idea that the um, it's this accumulation of the what we call protein rich fluid. So I guess that's another thing that's different in lymphedema compared to just normal average swelling is that there's this really high protein content to lymphedema. And that's part of why it's problematic, because, you know, people say, why can't we just give these people a fluid tablet and get rid of the fluid? And the reason why we can't do that is because it's not just fluid that happens to accumulate in the tissues during lymphedema. It's um, also all those other things that I talked about, um, you know, debris from reactions, you know, little old bits of dead cells and things like that, which in your body amounts to pretty much protein. And unfortunately in your body, protein is a real magnet for fluid. So what we see happening when people have fluid tablets is, um, you know, actually we get rid of a lot of the fluid component, but because this protein sort of sits in the tissues, um, more fluid just is drawn into that. So it doesn't work. Um, 
lymphedema is something that I'm talking today about um, breast cancer related lymphedema, but we know it can um, happen in a few different ways as well. So there's something that's called primary lymphedema, and that is this congenital malformation of the lymphatic system that can happen or be picked up at birth. It can be picked up later down the line as well. So some of the time, um, you know, it's something that becomes really obvious at different points. I guess it's more common in women. Um, so there are a couple of points in women's lives where, um, you know, they get a huge amount of extra fluid um, load and, um, you know, hormone changes and things. So either puberty uh, is where it can be picked up or then um, pregnancy is another time when it when it does sort of um, get picked up. And, um, you know, I guess uh, in my experience or some of the way I kind of explain this to people or explain it to myself, even this condition, um, I guess I have this idea that, you know, everyone's lymphatic system we know is individualized. So, you know, just like your fingerprint, your lymphatic system is different um, for each person. And what we see is that some people's lymphatic systems are really, really efficient. Um, they do a really fast, great job. And some people's lymphatic systems do a really slow, not very efficient job as well. Now, the other thing that happens in terms of, you know, whether or not you develop um, cancer related lymphedema is that you've got a similar thing happening where one lymph node might be way more important than another lymph node for your system as well. So we never know whether the lymph node that we are having to remove because it was the lymph node draining a cancer tumour is your most vital, really important lymph node for your arm or whether it's one of those like second rate lymph nodes that doesn't have to do as big a job. Um, and so that's where I think it becomes really difficult or well, that's part of the difficulty in absolutely predicting who is going to develop lymphedema and who's not. One of the most important things about lymphedema to remember is that it's a really slow buildup of fluid over time. And so what we see um, is people developing swelling probably about 18 months after they've had their initial cancer surgery. Um, it can be as long as three years. I think if you've got to 18 months, there's a really, you know, your chances of getting it after that are a lot, a lot, a lot smaller. Um, but yeah, I guess, yeah, lots of times people, you know, even when they're going through cancer treatments, they'll have in mind that they might need to be worried about lymphedema for like the first six weeks after treatment or, you know, maybe the first six months, something like that. But I always really like to make sure they know that this is something that can happen a lot later on. <laughs> Sorry, Jenny, as well. Um, if you're seeing swelling, if someone is concerned they might have lymphedema, but their swelling is popping up really rapidly over hours or really quickly over just a day or something like that, be much more concerned about other things. So there's a lot of other things that can cause lymphedema, oh, sorry, cause swelling in cancer patients as well. So really important to always rule out things like DVT or infection for them too. Next slide, please, Jenny. So who is more at risk of developing lymphedema? Really tricky to tell. Um, we know that it's about, yeah, this, I've got this figure here in front of you that's from 2013. So, you know, can be a little bit of change, but um, it's still pretty, pretty similar. It's about 20% um, of breast cancer patients develop lymphedema. Um, we know that people who have more extensive lymph node surgery are probably at more risk. Um, but having said that, people who have only just one node removed can still develop it as well. Um, we know that people are probably more at risk if they have a higher body mass index. Um, and interestingly, I think, um, you know, radiation treatment is a really... Um, you know, it's a factor that, that can lead to lymphedema as well. So um, we know that if you've had a mastectomy, so the whole of your breast removed with lymph node dissection as well, so that would usually be pretty extensive lymph node dissection, um, radiation treatment on top of that can increase your risk of lymphedema um, occurring. We know that if you're having um, an increased total dose of radiation, you're having overlapping radiation fields, uh, or in particular, you're having a posterior axillary boost is what they call it, where that, um, you know, big nodal basin in your axilla is also getting irradiated, then you're probably at more risk of developing it. 
Um, one of the strongest predictors of whether people would have lymphedema at 18 months was whether or not they had lymphedema, they had some type of swelling that we could measure in the first 12 months after their surgery. And that was um, something that was related to when they had greater than five nodes removed. Um, we know that lymphedema in developing in that first 12 months is actually something that can be related back to um, some of the other treatments that people have to undergo as well. So in particular, taxane based chemotherapy, which um, really plays havoc with people's, the way they manage fluid in their whole body um, is a really big culprit and, and being overweight is another thing that we know oh, that, you know, in this particular study that, that I referenced here was looking at um, being a predictor of potentially developing lymphedema for, for women that had had greater than five nodes removed. Interestingly, um, it was pointed out in this particular study I looked at by um, Sharon Kilbreath, a researcher from Sydney Uni, that um, lots of the factors which women are typically cautioned about for their risk of lymphedema in the studies that she did did not come up as anything that needed to be, that, that in actual fact could, could predict their risk of developing it. Um, so I'll go through a little bit of that later. So I'll just get you to click on for me, Denny. So as I mentioned, some of the really tricky parts about radiation and why it why it's um, more of a risk for people to develop lymphedema is to due to this development of fibrosis that happens throughout the tissue that's irradiated. So what we know is, you know, those beautiful channels regrowing that we had a look at in that poor little dog. Um, we know that this lymphatic proliferation um, and this kind of this lymphangiogenesis, this growth of the lymphatic lymphatic vessels is something that can be inhibited by the scarring from the radiation treatment. Um, and so that tissue that's been irradiated is much harder for your body to build all these new little channels. Um, and we know that the lymph nodes themselves are really highly sensitive to the radiation as well. So the lymph nodes themselves can get that little bit of extra damage through radiation too, where they, um, you know, first have these fatty kind of changes to them and then develop this fibrosis. Um, this can basically lead to the development of, of lymphedema where, you know, that point in the body becomes this spot where, you know, fluid cannot basically get through. Um, so um, that's why radiation doesn't help. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. <laughs> um, so really briefly, what makes the lymphatic system work harder? Um, we know um, gravity does. So similar to your vascular system, if you've got your peripheries, uh, so if you're upright and your arms are down, your hand will be more swollen by the end of the day. Um, we know that infection and injury um, creates an inflammatory reaction in your body and your body's natural reaction to infection or to injury is to send a whole heap of extra fluid and cells to repair. And what that um, effectively does is completely overload an already overloaded lymphatic system. And so it's really damaging. Um, that's where I guess lots of people can have, um, you know, it's an episode of cellulitis that can trigger, um, you know, lymphedema that, that sort of tips over into, um, you know, something that's a really noticeable swelling. Um, we know that um, another thing that your lymphatic system doesn't like is when you are really sedentary. Um, so your lymphatic system um, does better when your muscles are pumping and moving and um, when you sit still for prolonged periods, um, the lymphatic system doesn't pump as hard. And so that, I guess, makes it work harder. Um, we know that high uncontrolled blood pressure is something we want to avoid for people who have um, damaged lymphatic systems because um, high uncontrolled blood pressure means there's an increase in pressure in those arteries, which means the system, you know, as we go through that circulatory system, there's more leakage of fluid out into those tissues um, because, yeah, the, it's it's that pressure is higher and we're pushing more fluid out into the tissues and that eventually overloads the system as well. So high uncontrolled blood pressure is bad. We know that obesity is a real challenge for um, your lymphatic system or just increasing weight over your, um, you know, over time because essentially you don't regrow lymphatics, or don't regrow lymph nodes to deal with extra lymph, extra tissue. And so, um, you know, particularly if you've had radiation as well, where you've got this real challenge to regrowing any of those um, beautiful little channels that move the lymph. Um, yeah, we find that um, gaining weight 
makes the lymphatic system work harder. So next slide, please. Me? <laughs> so um, I think this is something that lots of people are always given, which I really don't like these lists of things that people should avoid because um, I think it's really, really limiting. There's probably a better way to put it. So my list of things that I would encourage people to avoid um, is a bit different. <laughs> but essentially, I have this approach of asking people to monitor their at-risk limb, to know their risk of developing um, lymphedema, to know their risk of um, the propensity to an increased risk of infection, um, and to action things if they see any changes, basically. So if they were to have a big injury or if they were to develop an inf you know, signs of an infection, so I go through that with people with a heat, swelling, redness, pain, if those things jump up, um, then do something about it. I've left a little link here. Um, I won't click on it or anything, but it goes to um, the Australasian Lymphology Association have a guideline on managing um, cellulitis in people with lymphedema. And they have recommendations for the um, antibiotics that are most useful to treat it because um, it's a little bit different when we're dealing with a lymphatic system that is damaged um, and sometimes you know broad spectrum isn't isn't the way to go so there's a little bit of advice um, on you know for gps in particular on that um, i always encourage people to monitor their blood pressure and to see your gp if you've got any any issues showing up with that as well um, you know years ago um, women who have lymphedema were encouraged not to um, take blood pressures, <laughs> um, definitely not to take them on their arm that's at risk. Um, but, you know, that could have, you know, I think in the past, some people have become so fearful of doing those things that they actually didn't monitor their blood pressure at all. And that's probably more of a risk for developing lymphedema than just a, um, you know, a very short, short duration blood pressure check um, every once in a while. Um, we know it's best if people can maintain a really healthy weight we know it's best if people can maintain a really active lifestyle. I always encourage people to live as normally as possible, as normally as they can, um, thinking about you know, any activities that might put you at more risk of things like developing an infection um, and seeing if there are some strategies you can implement that allow you to still continue to do the things that you love. So there's some simple stuff here. Wear gloves or long sleeves to garden. You know, you're, you're out there and in a position where you're probably going to get lots of cuts and scratches if you love to garden. And so making sure if you do get a cut or a scratch that you are um, addressing it, you're, you're not just ignoring it if you know if there's any redness and things you're, you're seeking some some assistance and you're, you're definitely you know implementing um, pretty straightforward first aid sort of stuff as well but being unsafe avoiding any you know horrendous sunburns that would act as another kind of injury and, and impact your lymphatic system like that um, if you can um, there's no need to take your blood pressure on your side that's at risk of developing lymphedema um, you can also, also offer your side that's not at risk for developing lymphedema for any blood draws or vaccinations. Um, having said that, there are some people that have the risk of developing lymphedema on both arms. And there's some newer research out that's shown us that, um, you know, what we thought was a really big um, risk factor for developing lymphedema or worsening lymphedema you know, in terms of blood draws from that arm um, that's at risk or has developed lymphedema, um, you know, it hasn't been shown to, to necessarily be, um, you know, the really, really um, difficult situation for those people that we thought it might be. So, you know, I guess, um, yeah, where possible you're, you're making sensible decisions, but you're really, you're really trying to still live and, and do what's necessary. Um, avoiding long periods of being sedentary is um, really important as well. So next slide, please, Jenny. So what makes the lymphatic system better? This is what we all came here for. <laughs> and um, I'm going to flick through some of these pretty quickly. Um, we've already been through blood pressure. I don't know if anyone's noticed that I put this um, little note here that gravity is something that makes the lymphatic system function better. And I guess I wanted to put that there just to make sure you knew that we can use gravity to help us as well. So I guess elevating a limb that is um, really swollen is a way to try and drain the fluid from it. Um, I'll just go for the next slide, please, Jen. 
So um, the next slide here is talking about how moisturising your skin is really important. And the reason why this is important is because it's um, protecting your skin is the best barrier to any kind of infection. So that risk of a um, infection as well as, um, you know, just making sure we've got that, that skin in the best condition that it can be is really, really important. Um, so whatever moisturiser people feel is best for them is great. Um, and yeah, keeping keeping the skin as healthy as possible. I guess this is also where I just briefly mentioned some of the massage that we do, and, and that's another um, reason to think about doing the massage that you can do for yourself every kind of day, because that's another way to just make sure you're paying attention to that skin and making sure it's well in, in a really good condition as well. Next slide, please, Jenny. <laughs> Deep breathing, it's a really nice little one. Um, if you think back to that um, little info, the little graphic we had um, displaying the lymphatic system, we know the larger collecting ducts sit right within the chest cavity. And taking a long, slow, deep breath changes the pressures, which helps draw some of the fluid from there into your, the larger collecting ducts for the lymphatic system as well. Um, so I tend to try and combine deep breathing with a few slow, um, arm exercises and things as well, just so that people are combining everything that they can and kind of um, not having to um, drag out all of the, <laughs> do everything separately, trying to kind of multitask together and get everything done quicker. Next slide, please. Um, I meant to get a picture for this, but I forgot, sorry. Um, compression garments are really important, especially once you have lymphedema that's, that is, um, you know, observable and um yeah uh, one of the best things that we can do is get people into really comfortable compression garments and do that as early as we can because the idea is that the um you know the more that compression garment is able to support their mus muscles and support their venous return um will have have some really good benefits from that um, i guess the sleeve protects their skin a little bit more as well um, and we know that the yeah the extra compression from the um, sleeve around the outside of the limb combined with the movement that people have um, when they're active really helps to push and move fluid as well. So next slide, please, Jenny. <clears throat> so the lymphedema treatment that um, we offer at the Caden Centre, I guess, goes through, um, you know, and lymphedema treatment in general is delivered by accredited um, clinicians. They can be physiotherapists, occupational therapists, or registered nurses. Um, at the Caden Centre, um, we have a really strong focus on education and exercise because this is a chronic condition and the idea that you're giving people some tools to manage their risk and to manage any um, you know, anything that might pop up for them is good. And, and the exercise, I guess, is probably one of the best tools we have to, to manage so many chronic health conditions. We know it can make a whole lot of difference for a whole lot of different things. Um, yeah, it's really important for people to be seen individually and to develop a, you know, a plan that is really based on their individual needs because um, there can be a whole lot of different limitations to how your lymphatic system works um, or the things that have made it um, you know have damaged it so things like scars in certain spots you know it's very difficult to move fluid through any kind of scar and so um, looking at ways to adapt massage and and you know in general things like compression bandaging or you know when it's best to utilize all those different kinds of treatments really important to that's I guess why it's kind of a specialty sort of system you know uh, a specialty of um, of those um, particular health health professions. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> so th this is the main bit, and hopefully I'll go through it really <laughs> not too much detail. I won't give you much longer, but. Um, I'm really excited about the benefits of exercise in lymphedema being shown to be really, really research based now. Um, I think we had um, a period of time there way back at um, you know, in the dark kind of times before we looked at much about the lymphatic system where essentially, um, you know, women were encouraged never to do anything that might make them sweat. I remember seeing some old lists that, um, you know, were given to patients at the MARTA, you know, years and years ago about what they should avoid and all of these things. And yeah, one of them was avoiding any sweating because that was potentially something they thought might overload the system. So really great to see that the research has shown us that actually um, 
you know, uh, the, lymph the lymphatic system depends on exercise, basically. Um, so uh, I guess the group, the little picture I put there is a group of dragon boaters. I don't know if they're um, dragons or breast dragon boaters, but that's a really important group of women who basically, um, I think, bucked the trend and decided that, you know what, I'm not going to live my life by, you know, without sweating. I'm going to do something else. Um, you know, actually, actually kind of, you know, take control in life. And the, and these, um, you know, women took up a sport that um, was doing all the things that were meant to be horrible for your lymphatic system. So doing something really intensive, really repetitive, definitely makes you sweaty. Um, and, you know, if all of those things um, made lymphedema occur or worsen lymphedema, we would see all of these dragon boat women having worse lymphedema, right? And essentially, um, we didn't see that. And so they're a really interesting group of people for researchers to take a look at. And they have been involved in a number of different, um, you know, clinical sort of trials that I've seen, you know, around a whole range of things. So looking at, you know, air travel and whether that impacts um, swelling for lymphedema. Um, we know that um, exercise now has been shown to be safe when it's individually prescribed and supervised. We know that um, your lymphatic the pumping speed of your lymphatic system is doubled when you're doing moderate intensity exercise and that um, increase to the speed of pumping is something that happens while you're exercising but it also is maintained for about the 24 hours after you stop exercising as well so if you're thinking about the kinds of things that you can do on a daily basis to manage your lymphedema moderate intensity exercise for about half an hour a day is one of those things that's going to help improve the functioning of your lymphatic system, which is great. Um, we know that staying physically active is really important um, because it helps us to, to do a whole range of things, maintain a healthy weight, improve cardiovascular fitness, as we um, mentioned about, you know, blood pressure being such an important um, factor for um you know, helping to decrease that load on your lymphatic system as well. We know that exercise has a whole range of other benefits that I talked through at the start in terms of, you know, um, addressing some of the other things that can come along with having lymphedema as well, including things like anxiety and depression, which are super common for people who develop lymphedema, and particularly people who develop really problematic lymphedema. Um, we know that um, actually, in terms of people who do have lymphedema, if the more, the more active people are, the less likely that they are to have some of those complications like infection and cellulitis. So next slide, please, Jen. I think I've only got a few left. <laughs> um, we know, yeah, there's a couple of really important um, clinical trials that were um, done. Um, some of them here in um, Perth as well. Um, there's a few different centres around Australia that have been looking at exercising lymphedema for a really long time as well. So we know that participating in resistance or aerobic based exercise did not change lymphedema status, but led to clinically relevant improvements in function and quality of life. So I guess, um, you know, this was a little snippet I took from <laughs> from a study. And the idea is that essentially it doesn't worsen lymphedema, which is I guess what what lots of people feel might might be the risk of doing doing something um, like exercise. Um, because we know that um, neither resistance or aerobic exercise showed to have you know more of an effect for um, improving or um, you know, um, changing lymphedema in a clinical way, I guess it, it means that um, exercise professionals have, um, you know, like you can basically structure an exercise program around what people enjoy, which is a really nice thing as well. So giving them a little bit of elements of both, but knowing that um, you don't have to, you know, you're not trying to do one or the other more as well. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Um, resistance training in lymphedema is one that's been a bit controversial, as I mentioned, over the years. Um, but a really um, great study put together by Prue Comey um, in WA um, in 2013, showing that um, people can work out at this really heavy, heavy sort of load, this six to 10 reps of a 75 to 85% rep max, um, without it actually aggravating um, or exacerbating their, their lymphedema in any way. So that's um, great. Um, we know, yeah, from this, I guess we can make sure people know they can do exercise safely. Um, 
The other thing that sometimes something that's, um, you know, wondered about in terms of what, what should happen for it is this idea of whether women who are at risk of lymphedema or have lymphedema should be exercising in their compression garment. Um, and look, this particular study that I found from 2015 was able to tell us that um, not wearing the sleeve for one acute bout of um, exercise, one exercise bout, didn't exacerbate lymphedema in the particular study group that they looked at. So I guess having said all of that, what we really do in practice is probably look really closely at what people feel individually works for them. I think that's that's the bottom line is that everyone's different. Um, Building people up into exercise is really important as well, making sure that we're kind of um, gradually improving them uh, or, you know, increasing loads and things like that, not starting out at this 75 to 85% RM either, um, trying to give them a little bit of a lead into that stuff as well. It's probably the best thing we can do for the lymphatic system too. Next slide, please. So... Back to spruiking the Caden Centre. <laughs> um, and this shows you that I'm almost to the end. Um, you know, in general, um, who would benefit from attending the Caden Centre or who, who would benefit from attending, you know, a cancer specialist, um, you know, exercise professional in general uh, is kind of anyone that is undergoing cancer treatment, um, anyone that has undergone cancer treatment. Um, we know that there's a whole range of improvements that we can expect for people. Um, in terms of, you know, basically trying to meet them at whatever level of physical activity they currently are at. Um, we know that if we can provide um, an exercise stimulus, um, you know, in the right way, it can, um, you know, result in adaptations in their body that uh, improve their fitness and their strength. So um, at the Caden Centre, we also see lots of people with any kind of chronic health condition and lots of cancer patients have lots of chronic health conditions as well. So we've seen people with things like arthritis, um, cardiovascular disease, um, respiratory conditions, neurological conditions and metabolic conditions as well. We know that all of these, all of these conditions can be improved by improving people's um, fitness. <laughs> um, next slide, please, Jenny. So at our centre, um, you know, we um, utilise GP management plans with, with people. We um, do what we can to try and bring the cost of the services that we offer down for them. Um, we utilise private health funds, we've got a high caps terminal. Um, there's a whole range of different third party kind of, um, yeah, places that we have um, connections with. So um, seeing people who have NDIS packages, um, seeing people who are covered by work cover. Um, a really exciting one is people who are able to use some of their home care or aged care packages to enable them to exercise, um, ongoing exercise sessions. That's a really great, great way for people, um, you know, who are lucky enough to have got all of those um, supports in place for them um, to, to be able to access something that's going to make a really meaningful difference to them. So um, additional to this, I guess, based on the Caden Centre being this charity, we do a lot to try and fundraise um, to financially assist people to attend. And there's, um, yeah, kind of a, a process for how, how we look at doing that um, on an individual base, basis. Um, depending, yeah, depending on what's, <laughs> what kind of fundraising we've been able to, to obtain and those kinds of things as well. So there's, um, yeah, a little bit more on that um, as well. I'll just go to the next slide, please, Jenny. So this is um, just a little flyer that we put together um, because something that we're gonna try and do um, off the back of, of this um, is basically offer a free um, education session for people um, on breast cancer related lymphedema. And so this is the very first, um, you know, uh, promotional <laughs> bit that we've done for it. Um, but yeah, we're planning to do it um, fairly soon. So Tuesday, the 6th of August, we're gonna run just an hour long session 
um, for people to come and attend to basically hear what we've gone through tonight, hopefully, um, and, you know, see if we can get this message out to, to people about, um, you know, identifying their risk and, you know, being aware of all the things they can do to help put them in a better position to not, not um, or, you know, either to recognise lymphedema and treat it early or to, to basically, um, you know, improve and manage their risk so that they don't develop it. Um, next slide, please. Jenny, I think this might be it. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> oh, that went backwards. Thank you. <laughs> and one more. So in terms of referring to our particular centre, um, people can self-refer. Um, we do GP um, referrals are one of the, the biggest sources of referrals for us, particularly because we're looking at those GP management plans through the team care arrangement and or the um, EPC. I forget what that stands for. Um, the, there's, yeah, we do have another... Um, platform medical objects we're able to receive referrals from that so that they're a little bit more secure as well We've got an online referral form at our website which is www.cadencenter.org.au um, and there's our phone and fax so next slide please jenny and that's it really i'd like to say thank you um thanks to jenny for the um you know beautiful work on the slides there um the next slide there's one more slide and but it's just the references for um the um information that i have used in the talk tonight um and that's it so thank you everyone for listening <laughs> thanks so much julia that was great um yeah julia had a uh, ooh, we don't want to do that. Let me close that. Um, didn't have great internet, which is why I was sharing the slides for her because um, it wouldn't work any other way, but it was fine. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. We did have um, one question, which was, do you work with people who have non-cancer related lower limb lymphedema? Um, we, yeah, we can, I've, I've worked with, um, people who have, um, yeah, either, you know, lymphedema from, uh, a whole range of causes. So, um, you know, orthopedic trauma and things like that. Um, yeah, in the, um, in the hospital system, um, you know, cellulitis, uh, and infection from lymphedema is one of the, the biggest, um, things that can bring people in to the hospital. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely have worked with, with, um, patients who have lower limb lymphedema and patients who have lymphedema from causes other than cancer as well, definitely. Great. Um, thank you very much, Julia, for your time tonight. Um, don't forget everybody to fill in the evaluation when it pops up and you will also get a certificate emailed to you. All right, thanks everybody and I'll see you all next time. Thanks everyone, thank you.